This talk is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about co-limits and limits. Um, it's been mostly co-limits and limits of modules. So um, first of all, I'll start by recalling what a co-limit or a limit is in a very general and abstract way, and then I'll give lots of examples which will hopefully make it clearer what it is. So for a co-limit, what we do is we take a category C, and a category has some objects and some morphisms between them. So I'll sort of draw a picture of a category here has four objects and a few morphisms between them drawn as arrows. And we take a functor F from the category C to the category of modules over a ring. Or more generally, we could do um, it to a functor to any category, but we we'll be mostly talking about co-limits and limits of modules over a ring. What this means is we choose a module for each object of the category, and we choose morphisms between the modules corresponding to morphisms of the category C. Um, so we might have modules M1, M2, M3, and M4, and morphisms between them corresponding to these things here. And then a co-limit is a sort of universal object that all these modules map to. So what this means is there is a module M and there are morphisms from all these MI to M making, making um, everything in this diagram commute. And furthermore, M is universal with this property. This means that if we take any other module M prime with um, maps from all the M i to M prime making everything commute, then there's a unique map from M to M prime. So um, M is the sort of best possible object we can find with, with maps from all the M i's to M making it commute. Um, so, so, so this element M is called a limit, sorry, a co-limit, of um, this functor from C to modules. Um, we define limits in the same way, um, except that instead of having maps from the MI to M, we have maps from M to all the MI. So um, let me call this N rather than M. So a limit is going to be a map, an object with maps to all the MIs making it commute, which is universal in the sense that if we've got any other object with maps to all the M's, then there's a unique map going like that. Well, this rather abstract definition is a bit hard to understand when you first come across it. So what I'll do is I'll just give lots of examples of limits and co-limits and hope that this will make it clearer what's gonna happen. So, so um, let's start with a simple example, let's just take the category C to consist of two points with no morphisms between them. So the only morphisms are going to be the identity maps for these two objects. So what does a limit or a co-limit mean? Well, it means you take two modules, M1 and M2, and we're trying to find a module M with a universal which is universal for maps from M1 and M2 to it. And this, this co-limit is going to be M, the direct sum of M1 and M2. And you can see this is a co-limit because if you take any other module M prime with maps from M1 and M2 to M prime, then there's obviously a unique map from M1 plus M2 to M prime making this commute. So, so M1 plus M2 is the co-limit. Of, um, of this particularly simple function taking that point to M1 and that point to M2. Um, somewhat confusingly, it turns out the limit is also the direct sum of M1 and M2. Um, this is, in general, limits are not the same as co-limits, but they happen to be in this particular case. So again, if we take the direct sum of M1 and M2, this maps to M1 and M2 by projection, and it's also universal for this property because if we take any module N with a map to M1 and M2, then it's easy to see there's a unique map going like that. So this is also a limit. 
So direct sums, um, and I guess this is really a direct product, but products and modules have to be the same as sums, at least finite ones. So that wasn't very difficult. Now let's try taking C to be an infinite number of points. So we've got modules M1, M2, M3, and so on. And now there's a difference between the co-limit and the limit because the co-limit is the sum of M1 and M2 and M3 and so on. So it's universal for maps like that. So this is the co-limit. Whereas the limit is now the product, which maps to all of these. And the difference between the sum and the product is um, the sum is a submodule of the product. It consists of all elements of the product such that all but a finite number of entries are zero. So in this case, the limit is no longer equal to the co-limit. Um, this is actually something funny that happens in abelian categories. The, the direct sum happens to be the same as the direct product. Um, so now let's take some categories which have morphisms in them. So here I'm going to take C to be the category with two elements and two arrows between the, the, these objects. So now let's take um, a functor from C to the category. It means we have to choose an object for each object of the category. So we pick two modules. And now we've got to pick a morphism for each of these two diagrams. And I'm going to map one of these to the zero morphism and the other one to some random morphism F. And now we want to know what is a co-limit. Well, a co-limit is going to be a, a module M with a map from M2 to M and a map from M1 to M such that everything commutes. Well, if you think about it a bit, um, what this means is that M is equal to M2 um, modulo the image of um, M1 under F. So here we see that a co-limit is more or less a quotient. Um, if M1 happens to be a submodule of M2, then it's exactly a quotient. In general, it's, it's a quotient of M2 by the, by the um, um, image of M1. Um, well, what happens if we take, uh, if we try taking a limit of this? Well, for a limit, we've got M1 mapping to um, M2 by these two maps here. So what we want is a um, module N, which maps to N1 and it maps to M2. And this diagram commutes, so this must be the zero map. So the composition of this and F must be the zero map. In other words, N must map to the kernel of F. And in fact, you can see that N is actually equal to the kernel of the map from F, from M1 to M2. So in this case, we see the limit is the kernel of, um, uh, uh, of this morphism. So, so co-kernels or quotients and kernels are special cases of uh, um, co-limits and limits. Um, now let's have a look at um, some slightly more complicated categories. So now suppose we take the category C to be the following category. I'm going to take an infinite sequence of objects, and there are going to be morphisms between them like this. Um, and you also have other morphisms. For instance, there's a single morphism from there to there, but it should be reasonably obvious what this category is. If you want, you can identify this category with the natural numbers, and you say there's a morphism from a natural number to another, if and only if the first one is less than or equal to the second. Um, and what do co-limits look like? Well, well, we have to take a functor from this category to the category of modules. And this means we have a sequence of modules with each module having a morphism to the next one. And now suppose each 
mi is actually a submodule of mi plus one, then what's the co-limit? Well, the co-limit means we have to find a module m, and there must be maps from all the m i's to m making everything commute. And you can then see that m is just the union of all the m i. That's in, in the special case that the m i's are submodules of the next one. So a co-limit in this case is just a union. Um, what's the limit? Well, the limit isn't terribly exciting because for the limit, we have to take a module n, which is universal for maps going like that. Well, well, obviously, in that case, everything is just determined by the map from n to m0, because then this map must be the composition and so on. So the limit um, is just m0. Um, which is a rather trivial sort of operation. So the limit of, of, a, of a diagram like that just isn't interesting. Um, if these maps are not inclusions, then the co-limit can be a little bit more complicated. For example, suppose we take um, Z mapping to Z mapping to Z, and suppose each of these maps is zero. Then what's the co-limit? Well, it must be a module um, such that there are maps from all these z's to m, and everything must commute. Well, well, this map here must be zero because it factors through this zero map and some other map here. So this is zero, and similarly, this is zero, and this is zero, and so on. So you can see from this that m must actually be the zero module. So um, the co-limit of this map where they're, they're not inclusion is actually zero, even though all these modules are non-zero. So, so co-limits can sort of unexpectedly collapse things. Um, we can also take um, um, limits and co-limits with maps going the other way. So now suppose C is the following category. So now we're going to take the maps going um, to the left rather than the right. Well, in this case, the co-limit. So what's the co-limit? Well, the co-limit is going to be some element M with maps going like that. Um, so here's M0 and M1 and M2. And obviously, this map here is determined by this map because it's just the composition and so on. So so everything is determined by the map from M0 to M. So we see the co-limit is just M0. So it's not very exciting. What about the limit? Well, this is more interesting. It's sometimes called the direct limit of these modules here. And what we need is um, a map from a module M to all these MIs, making everything commute. And the construction of this is as follows. M is given by as follows. You take the product M0 times M1 times M2, except you take the submodule of elements of this, of what elements M0, M1, M2, and so on, such that Mi and Mj have, um, have um, sorry, so, so, so that Mi has image Mj whenever I is greater than J. So we must take an element in M0 and an element in M1 and an element in M2 and so on. And these must all be compatible, that the element in M0 we chose must be the image of the element in M1 and so on. Um, so th this is also sometimes called a projective limit. And will be used quite a lot when we um, discuss completions. Um, what happens in practice is we might take an ideal R 
So we not, might take an ideal I inside a ring R, and we might, for instance, form a series of modules R over I, R over I squared, R over I cubed, and so on. So if you've seen the construction of the p-adic numbers, um, this is what you do to construct p-adic numbers. Um, so um, next you can ask what happens if you've got some sort of really complicated category. Suppose you've got a category that looks like this. And there are lots of maps going like that all over the place, I don't know. Of some sort of random collection of um, modules like this. So what does the co-limit look like? Well, the co-limit can be given by generators and relations sometimes. So what we can do is suppose each of these modules is just a copy of the ring R just to be precise, and suppose each of these is a copy of the, of the ring R, then what we can think of is that for each of these modules, we get one generator of the module. So, so we might take um, a, a generator of the module R, say one, and call that um, M1 and call this M2 and call this M3 and so on. And then our module is going to be generated by the elements M1, M2, M3 and so on, except we have to identify some things here. So, so for each of these, we might get some sort of relation. So if you've got an element um, um, X here, say, mapping to the element B here and the element C here, then we would have the relation that um, uh, B, which is an element of um, M2, is equal to C in this module M3. So, so we've got some relation identifying some multiple of M2 with some multiple of M3. And similarly, we can get relations from these other um, elements here. So, so co-limits are a sort of very closely related to presenting modules by generators and relations. Um, there are various special cases which have a rather confusing collection of names for them, which I quite often get wrong because I always get a bit confused about this. First of all, there's a direct limit. Um, um, so this is a special case of a limit for a directed post set. So what's a post set? Well, a post set is just a partially ordered set. And we can think of this as a category with at most one morphism between any two elements A and B. And to turn a post set into a category is very easy. Suppose we've got a post set with, say, four elements, and that element is less than that, and that element's less than that, and that element's less than that. Then we can form a category out of it just by putting morphisms between them um, if, if one element is less than another. So, so post sets can be thought of as special sorts of categories with only one morph, with at most one morphism between objects. And so, so we can form limits and co-limits over post sets. And these are sometimes called direct limits and direct co-limits, provided the post set is directed. So what does directed mean? Well, um, directed means that if you're given two elements, um, A and B of your post set, we can find C with C is greater than A, and C is greater than B. Or maybe C is less than A and C is less than B, depending on which way around your, your cosets are. Um, there's, um, th 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 there are two versions of directed posets, which are obviously sort of equivalent if you change the direction of the order of the posets. So what this means is given any elements A and B, we can just find an element C 
like that, or possibly with the arrows going the other way, if you want the other convention. Um, so um, direct limits and direct co-limits usually mean your category is really a directed pose set, which is a rather easy case. Projective um, limit sometimes means your category looks like this. Um, um, and th th there's a sort of generalization of directed post set to categories called a filtered category. And a filtered category is one like this. It means given A and B as objects, we can find an element C such that A and B both map to C. So we can find C and maps from A and B to C. So that's the first condition. There's a second condition, which says that given element A and B and two maps between them, we can find some element C and a map H from B to C, so that the composition um, H, F, and H, G are the same. So the two maps from A to C become the same. Notice the second condition is, is trivial for a post set. So um, if, if a, a post set being filtered is the same as asking for it to be directed. Of course, there's a dual version of this where you turn all the arrows the other way around, but we'll usually be using this version. Um, so for example, um, direct sums, where you take two elements like that and take a limit, are not filtered limits, or rather filtered co-limits. Because given these two objects, we can't find an object they're mapping, they're both mapping to. Um, similarly, co-kernels are not filtered. So here, our category has um, two objects and maps like that. And it satisfies the first condition because given any two objects, we can find one they both map to, but it doesn't find, satisfy the second condition because given these two arrows, there's no, we, we haven't given another object such that these two arrows become equal. So co-kernels and direct sums are not filtered co-limits. Um, some of the infinite unions are. Now I want to give some examples of um, filtered and non-filtered co-limits. Um, for example, suppose you take a localization of a ring or module. Let's, let's just do a ring um, at a multiplicative subset S. Then the localization R S to minus one is a filtered um, co-limit. Here, um, it's a filtered co-limit of the object R, where we adjoin uh, a little, sorry, uh, I'm not making the difference between capital S and little s the same. So this is a, this, this is a filtered co-limit of rings where you invert one element for S inside this multiplicative subset. And what you're doing is you're taking a limit that looks like this. So take R T to minus one and R U to minus one and so on. And we get a map from this to this. Whenever um, um, S divides T, in other words, T is equal to S times S one for some um, element of the uh, multiplicative subset. And this is filtered because the subset is closed, S is closed under multiplication. So for ex example, we've got R U to the minus one and R T to the minus one, and we can map these both to R U T to the minus one. So, so the, the, the fact that this is a filtered co-limit is because the subset is multiplicative. Um, if you recall, we, also did mention you could do 
localization at non-multiplicative subsets, but that was a little bit more complicated. It wouldn't be a filtered co-limit, and usually what you do is you just make the subset multiplicative. Um, so another example is Q is a filtered co-limit of copies of Z. So we can take Z maps to Z maps to Z and so on. And we can have this is multiplication by one, this times two, this times three and so on. And this is a filtered set. And if you think about it a bit, the co-limit of this is just Q with this mapping to Q and this mapping to, um, we would really have to sort of multiply elements of Z by half here and times one over six there and so on. So this would make this, or, so if, if we do that, then then all, all these maps um, commute and you can see the rational numbers as a filtered co-limit of copies of Z. Um, there's a confusing example. So let me put this as a warning. Let's look at the following two examples. Suppose you've got a map from Z to Z to Z to itself, and each of these maps is multiplication by two. And you can also ask, what about this map here? Uh, if these are all the same Z, why don't you just take a map from Z to itself and that, that's multiplication by two? And um, you might think the co-limit of these two things is the same because all we're doing is taking Z mapping to itself under multiplication by two. But in fact, these are diff quite different co-limits. So the co-limit of the first one is given by Z, the, 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 <coughs> um, the ring Z adjoined a half, except we're thinking this as being a module because um, we can map this to, um, here we map, the map from here to here is given by multiplying an element of Z by a half, and similarly we multiply it by a quarter, and here by an eighth, and so on. And you can see this diagram is now commutative, and it's fairly obvious that Z a half is, is kind of the, the limit of these. On the other hand, the co-limit of this diagram is actually zero, because um, the element one is mapped two by this map here. So the, 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 the elements one and two must map the same element here and the co-limit is actually just zero. Um, so what you've got to be aware of is that um, you shouldn't think of this. This is not a subcategory spell subcategory of um, modules over Z. It is a functor from the category like this to Z. Um, and quite often, if you've got a functor from something to Z, if all these things have different images, then it's harmless to think of it as being a subcategory. But there are cases when these give different answers. Um, this distinction between um, functors from something to Z, to the, it's not Z, that's modules over Z. So the distinction between a functor to modules over Z and a subcategory of modules over Z normally doesn't matter, but every now and then it really confuses people. Um, at the moment, um, Mochizuki announced a proof of the ABC conjecture, and this proof has caused a certain amount of controversy and confusion. And one of the confusing things about his proof is that Mochizuki appears to be using a non-standard definition of um, limits and co-limits. And according to Mochizuki's definition, the um, co-limit of this appears to be zero because he he tries to regard this as a subcategory of the module of modules over the integers rather than as a functor from, from this category to modules over the integers. So there's, there was a certain amount of argument between people about what exactly was going on in Mochizuki's papers. So, so normally the difference between this doesn't matter, but sometimes it does. So you 
really need to remember that this isn't really a subcategory, it's a functor from a category to modules. Um, so the next problem is how do co-limits and limits behave with respect to exactness? So in other words, if I've got a sequence of um, exact sequences, a i goes to b, i goes to c, i goes to naught, and I take a limit or co-limit of these, you might look at naught goes to limit, the a i goes to limit, b i goes to the limit, c i goes to naught. We can ask, is this exact? Um, so next lecture we'll be discussing exactness of limits and co-limits. And the answer is sometimes this is exact and sometimes it isn't. <laughs>